Close your eyes and imagine you are standing in a beautiful field, a wide open field full of colorful flowers gently blowing in the breeze. You can hear the birds, the wind rustling in the grass, and perhaps above it all, the slight humming buzz of a honeybee. Watch as it works its way into the flower. The bee will extract the pollen within and take it back to its hive to create honey for other bees and larvae, not for humans. But we take the honey all the same. I bet you didn't know it takes two million flowers to make a single pound of honey. There's a great deal of concern in the world today about the massive drop in the bee population, not just because it would deprive us of honey, but also because the bees are incredible pollinators. In a process of collecting pollen going from flower to flower, they spread that pollen around and make possible the beautiful field you are imagining in your mind right now. Hello there, my name is Mr. Little, and first I want to thank you for joining me. I sincerely hope that you and your loved ones are safe and well during this time of COVID-19. Please wear a mask and continue to practice a safe distancing. Today, I'd like to discuss the issue of trade and exchange within the context of a pre-Columbian society and the way in which it is discussed and depicted in US history classrooms. I hope you'll stick around. Please hold on to that image of the bee. Uh, we will return to it later. Before we get too deep into today's video, I'd like to quickly point out that I have actually made a video about this topic before, taking a larger look at the entire Americas. That's linked in the description below if you'd like to check that out. Additionally, within this video, there are many words from the Nahuatl language, which is spoken by many indigenous people in Mexico. Though I have made my best effort to find proper phonetic pronunciation, if I say a word in Nahuatl that is not terribly correct, I'll simply have to say Mashine Shlakpopowi. That probably wasn't correct either, but I'm doing my best here, okay? And just in case you're curious, I'm not going to be touching on the issue of human sacrifice. This is definitely a topic of discussion. However, that's just simply not the topic I'm going to be covering today. One feature of pre-Columbian societies is something known in English as the tribute list. These are recorded in a codex or codices, which are large books or folios created with strips of bark or deer skin. Most of the codices we have provide an interesting insight into pre-Columbian societies. Tribute from the Latin tributum is wealth that one party gives to another, either as a sign of respect, submission, or allegiance. Various ancient states extract tribute from the rulers of the lands which those states had either conquered or had threatened to conquer. This has been a feature of pre-Columbian societies at least as far back as the ancient Maya. An example of cultural exchange within the pre-Columbian Americas, as it became a feature of the Aztec Empire, the last major pre-Columbian state to exist in central Mexico before the arrival of the Europeans. In the language of the Aztec Empire, Nahuatl, the word tribute is tequito. A quick note on some terminology. The Aztec Empire is sometimes referred to as the Triple Alliance or the Mexica. This references two ideas. One idea is that the Aztec Empire was not so much an empire in the traditional sense of the word as it was an alliance between three major cities located in central Mexico. The word in Nahuatl, Ikan Tlatoloyan, literally means the three places where decisions are made. This refers to those three cities, hence Triple Alliance. The names of those cities are Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan. Two, the word Mexica refers to the ethno-linguistic identity of the group of people that inhabited the largest of these three cities, which was Tenochtitlan. If you're wondering, the word Aztec entered the Spanish language through a description of the legendary homeland of the Mexica people, Aztetlan. For this video, I will use the term Triple Alliance. One very interesting thing about the tribute lists, if you were to Google Aztec tribute list, most of the results you would see are actually not from the time of the Triple Alliance. In fact, two out of the three main sources we have for tribute lists were created after the Spanish conquest in the 1560s in order for the Spanish to recreate the tribute system for themselves. The only tribute list recorded in the time of the Triple Alliance is the tribute record of Tlapa from the tribute region of Tlapa, roughly corresponding to the modern day Mexican state of Guerrero. This region was subjugated by the Triple Alliance in 1486, and they would pay tribute right up until 1521, the year Tenochtitlan fell to the Spanish. This provides scholars with 36 years of tribute data. According to accounts, there was once a room in Tenochtitlan which held all of the tribute codices, 
But that room was destroyed during the conquest of the city. Wars tend to do that to the valuable pieces of the past. So the populations of the cities of the Triple Alliance migrated into what is now central Mexico in the early 13th century. The Nahuatl-speaking peoples settled on Lake Texcoco, founding Tenochtitlan. They themselves paid tribute to the city-state of Azcapotlauco. This was the case until Azcapotlauco collapsed into a civil war, and the three cities, Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan, participated, winning autonomy from their previous overlords. The three cities then signed the Triple Alliance in 1430, a power-sharing agreement, and from then on began to dominate most of central Mexico. So how did the tribute system work? When the armies of the Triple Alliance subjugated a city or group of peoples, they demanded semi-annual tribute payments, though some sources say maybe up to four times a year. And as long as this was paid, the Triple Alliance generally left the region alone, even leaving the former rulers in power. Once a group had submitted to the Triple Alliance, there was a ceremony in which the ruler was ritually, symbolically dethroned. An official, known as the Calpique, was installed in the region. Their job was to oversee the collection and transportation of the tribute back to central Mexico. For this, the Pochteca were often utilized. I have spoken of the Pochteca before in my previous videos, but if you're not sure about them, think about them as a class of long-distance merchants who also acted as spies for the Triple Alliance leaders because of the fact that they traveled so much and so far. Hence, the Pochteca were essential in moving tribute goods to their destinations within the realm of the Triple Alliance. What items were demanded of the people of Tlapa, according to the records? Well, the most commonly demanded item was woven cloth in the form of the manta, a kind of square woven cloth. In one year of tribute, the Talapa sent over 6,000 pieces of manta cloth back to the Triple Alliance. Just a reminder of how much clothing and textiles dominates our understanding of human history. The second most demanded item was gold, either pressed into a bar about three kilograms in weight or in the form of gold dust. After gold, other items demanded included warrior suits made out of animal skins, live turkeys, balls of rubber, and other unique goods that might have only been local to that particular area. It is estimated by the archaeologist Gerardo Gutierrez that over the 36 years of paying tribute, the Tilapans provided the Triple Alliance with almost 2,300 kilograms of solid gold, possibly as much as 6,000 kilograms of gold dust, and over 170,000 pieces of manta cloth. So how can you read one of these tribute lists? Well, the answer is left to right and bottom to top. Each row corresponds to an account of tribute, which according to here were broken up into four cycles, each corresponding to a seasonal festival. And the first three columns correspond to tribute obligations. For example, this symbol stands for a gold bar, this one for half a gold bar, this one for gold bars broken into fifths, and this one refers to gold dust. This one is a senpolkiamili, or 400 pieces of manta cloth. The next column corresponds to the month, August, November, February, and May. The final column represents the year, and in this case we see two circles, because it was the second year of this particular cycle of the calendar. This particular folio in the codex comes from the final year of tribute provided. Because the Triple Alliance generally left the tribute regions alone as long as the tribute flowed, this has led to some debate as to if the title of empire is appropriate, as the Triple Alliance did not fundamentally reshape the political structures of conquered regions. The archaeologist Michael E. Smith has argued that the transfer of goods should not be categorized as tribute, but rather as regular taxes. This is in part because even peoples outside of the tribute system provided labor and resources for the state. Hence, there is some debate within the academic community as to whether tribute is the proper term to discuss this entire issue and the movement of these goods. On the surface, this arrangement definitely doesn't sound like trade or exchange in the old world style. A Silk Road, this was not. The payment of goods from one region to another by force and imposed by the threat of violence is not usually considered to be trade and exchange. We normally refer to Adam Smith's definition from the Wealth of Nations, quote, in a free trade, an effectual combination cannot be established but by the unanimous consent of every single trader, and it cannot last longer than every single trader continues of the same mind." End quote. Any even simple glance at the long history of exchange and networks in the old world will indicate they were by no means free. There were limits on who was allowed to trade and participate in the trade. Political rulers might routinely confiscate the wealth outright of merchants they didn't like 
and nations were known to go to war over trade routes. So let us forego this simple concept of trade. And if we take a closer look at the tribute lists themselves, there seems to be suggestions of a system with a degree of flexibility that encouraged the movement of goods. There is a discrepancy between the post-conquest central Mexican sources and the sources from the Tlapan tribute list. Specifically, the Tlapans over time paid more in gold instead of animal skins, despite the fact that the records indicate that animal skins continued to be demanded as tribute. This is fascinating because it suggests a few things. One is recognition by the Kalpikske that each of their tribute regions was different, meaning they were open to demanding particular tribute from each region, hence extractive specialization. For example, the region of Xokonoko was expected to send bird feathers as it was made up of rainforest, and the region of Koyalapa was expected to provide dyes made from the insect cochineal found in that area. Two is the possibility of the interconvertibility of goods established by the Triple Alliance. In other words, establishing values of various goods, such as one gold tablet being worth 45 mantas, as one scholar has calculated based on the existing records, this could shape the supply and demand of a particular good and perhaps even imply an interregional negotiation of goods. That might also explain why certain regions were required to pay tribute in goods that were not even native to those areas. In addition to bird feathers, Shonanoko was required to send tribute in gold even though there was no gold in that particular region. The Pochteca, who I mentioned earlier, could have worked with the Kalpikske and moved the goods around the various tribute states to help them pay tribute. Evidence of this comes from a story in the early Spanish period, where a local Kalpikske had to borrow money from a Pochteca to pay tribute to the Spanish. Three is the possibility of corvée labor. While we normally associate labor-based taxation with the Incas, there is some evidence that perhaps these discrepancies were being made up with by labor from the tribute peoples. This is supported by accounts of tributes being fulfilled by transporting raw materials to locations where they are made into goods for the market. In summary, while the tribute lists and the movement of goods around Central Mexico is not a perfect free exchange that we think of today when we describe a trade network, it is a system of a movement of goods based on a degree of supply and demand and specialization. And all of this points to a degree of trade and exchange within the region of pre-Columbian Central Mexico. Remember the story of the bee. The bee collects pollen for its own needs, but unintentionally pollinates the entire field, creating more flowers. As far as we know, this is not within the design of the honeybee's plans, yet it is what an economist might call a positive externality or a positive consequence. Just as the Triple Alliance demanding tribute from subjugated regions unintentionally helped promote trade and exchange region-wide, historians must consider the unintended consequences along with the intended ones. And this brings me to the last part of the video, which is how this is talked about in US history classes. A survey of some of the largest state history standards show that the Aztecs usually are included in one to two standards, whereas the other major classical era trade routes are in anywhere from two to five standards. And even those standards that talk about the Aztecs usually focus on the politics, trade, and culture, a rather ambiguous term. Even the College Board's AP World History course, in my humble opinion, one of the most comprehensive looks at world history prior to the university level, removed references to pre-Columbian trade routes in their 2018 reorganization of the course. Although they did include the tribute list, and that's part of the reason why I'm making this video. Still, you might be asking, you know, why does this matter at all? Well, the history of trade routes and networks of exchange are a major part of human history and a major part of any history course. Societies involved in exchange are viewed as positives, the forces moving history along. I like the quote from historian William McNeil, quote, how people created webs of interaction and how those webs grew, what shapes they took in different parts of the world and how they combined in recent times and how they altered the human's role on this planet. This perspective on the past sheds a ray of light on the dilemmas of the present and the future. End quote. Now take that quote and consider that perhaps 25% of the world's population is being left out of this general description of the trends of humanity in most world history courses. But I think that Amanda Duomaral, founder of Fiveable, said it best when she questioned Trevor Packer, the leader of College Board, about the 2018 reorganization, the very organization that removed the references to pre-Columbian history. I'll let her say it. Schools want to teach what's on the test because the kids want to learn what's on the test, and the parents want to learn want their kids to learn what's going to be on the test. You cannot tell my black and brown students that their history is not going to be tested and then assume that that's not going to matter, right? The people in power in our country already are telling our those same students that their history, that their present, that their future doesn't matter. And when by you making this decision, you are going along with that. Leaving out the story of the pre-Columbian exchange networks effectively severs the Americas 
from the stories of trade and exchange that characterize most of the human past. And world history, this is not. Well, I certainly hope you found that interesting, and I want to thank you so much for joining me. And since you've made it all the way here, why not like and subscribe and leave a comment below. You can also check me out on Twitch, and I do have a Discord. Links in the description below. In addition, I have continued to include the links to assist with the situation in Afghanistan, so if you can give, please do. But I want to thank you so much for joining me. My name is Mr. Little, and I hope I'll see you next time.